I think we ought to put our hands together and just give God thanks for being such a wonderful, merciful God to us. Amen. 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 Worship team, thank you so much. Thank you for worshiping the Lord this morning. Aren't you glad that you can come to God's house this morning and know him and feel his presence? Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you. You know, when you talk to Christians, and I'm just saying Christians, you can tell pretty quick in conversations with Christians where they are as far as um, how alive they are in Christ. Um, we're all living in the same world, right? Nobody's in a different world. We're all in the same culture, dealing with the same challenges. But you can tell people that are getting their life and getting their strength in Christ because even in the midst of the most difficult times, there seems to be this um, heart that begins to just somehow take over the emotions and the feelings and the circumstances. And people just that are really living in Christ and driven by the Holy Spirit, when they get into his presence, it doesn't, it, it's, it's easy for them to get in his presence because they live there and in his presence, and you can just sense that there's just something different about them. I want to be that kind of person. How about you? Amen? Come on, somebody. I want to be that kind of person that I don't have to let the weight and the cares of the world. You know, if the weight and the cares of the world could knock us out of faith, then that means that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't good enough. And that's not the case at all. He paid it all. Everything he did was more than enough for us. And so I'm just thankful for the, for the, the life of Christ that lives on the inside of me. How about you? Amen? Well, I want to take a few moments this morning and kind of shift gears kind of where we've been um, and I kind of want to lift up your hearts and lift up your spirit this morning with the truth this morning and just kind of re-tap into a truth that I feel like that we probably have gotten away from because of all the voices and all the information that we get um, influenced by in this world that we live in. And I want to talk to you this morning about having true and authentic joy in your life. And you were saying, well, Pastor, why are you bringing a message like this? There's people that are struggling in life. There's people that are, they need to know what's getting ready to happen. And we need to be focusing on the prophetic side of, of um, uh, where things are. But I want to tell you something. If you don't have real joy flowing in your life, then even the words of the prophets and even those things that give forewarning to our hearts. Um, if you don't have joy in your life, then, then I'm telling you, all of those things are only going to compound the stress and compound the, 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 the weight of what you're already carrying. And I believe that the joy of the Lord is something that God wants us to be able to walk in every single day because the joy of the Lord is our... See, I'm already on the right message. I can already tell. You're, you're ready for it this morning. Have you ever thought about this? Aren't you thankful that as a Christian, we are not responsible to manufacture our own source of joy? Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, really think about that, that when it comes to the joy of the Lord and, and the, the, the purpose of the joy and having authentic joy, aren't you thankful that we are not responsible to personally have to manufacture that? Yet even as a Christian, life has this way, and if we're honest with ourselves, of causing us to become confused, when you think about it, with where our source and our supply of joy comes from. And if you're not careful, when we find ourselves in this place where we don't feel the joy of the Lord that we need to have, and we begin to think that we are the ones responsible for our joy and that we can manufacture our joy, then you know what our tendency is, is we begin to just stuff more things in our life. We just begin to put more things inside, around us, a part of our lives, hoping that it will produce some lifting of our spirits. And all we're doing is just simply just putting more things in our life that need to be charged up. It's like everything is battery operated and everything we, we bring around our life, it, while it might be running well and it might be full of life and making us feel good, the problem is it's going to run out of juice. 
And then we're responsible to keep all those things that we've put in our lives alive and charged up like a battery. And we don't have that kind of strength in us to be able to keep the, the added things that we keep putting in our lives. We don't have the kind of strength in us to keep those things alive so that way they can bring joy in our lives. Now, let me get the bad news out of the way, but it's bad news you already know. We're living in a very depressed time right now. Uh, I don't have to stand here and tell you the staggering numbers of the increase of depression, anxiety, fear, uh, sadness, just people just living. It's everywhere you go. You can see it on people's face. You can see it on people's Facebook. <laughs> see what I did there? You can... You can <laughs> You can, you, can, you can see it, even, you can even see it in the church. You can see that there's a, there's a, there's a depression that seems to have just kind of come over the whole world and it's kind of got everybody in a sense of gloom. And as I'm, while I'm staying on this little this news, it kind of feels like bad news for just a moment. Let me just go get one other thing out of the way. You know, based on what I think the evaluation is of 2021, um, it just might end up being maybe just as difficult as 2020 if, if, we, if, we, if you want to know the truth. Have you ever felt the devil tell you something like this? You would have more joy if you would, and whatever that is. You, you, you would have more joy if you did this. You, you, would, you would be happier if you took this or brought this specific thing in your life. Let me tell you something. Don't ever let the devil diagnose your happiness. And don't ever let him write out a prescription for your source of joy. Because everything that he's going to tell you that's going to make you happier is a trick to make you worse. And you and I have to be able to recognize that. And I think that's one of the hardest things right now for Christians who are desperate for some kind of lifted up life and joy in their life is that we are so desperate that we are literally buying into the idea that if we can just get one more thing in our life, if we can just add one more thing, if, if one more thing would just go well in our life, then, then we would get to the point where we would be full of joy and we would have authentic joy. But I want to share with you that authentic joy is not a byproduct of your circumstances. Authentic joy is more of a byproduct of your heart and the life and the faith of God that's living in there. In fact, Paul describes it as the fruit of the Spirit. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of joy. Now, I want to go to, two, I want to, go to one verse in two different translations, and I just want to show you the dichotomy of someone that has joy, what it looks like in your physical and spiritual life versus somebody that doesn't. Because this one specific verse in Proverbs chapter 17 gives you and I the dichotomy of what it means to have it and what it means not to have it. And today, I don't believe there's any middle ground. I think a person is either full of joy or they're struggling in life. I don't think there's any middle ground today. I think that's gone. I think those days are gone. So look at Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22, somewhat of a familiar passage of scripture. But here's what he says, a joyful heart is good medicine. How many like good medicine, right? But a broken spirit drains one's strength. Okay? Now, I want to show you this in the King James Version. That was a, another translation. The King James Version says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. So here's the foundational truth I want to make sure that we get. If we're going to talk about joy and if we're going to start looking at finding that authentic joy to be the source of what we live on every day of our life, regardless of our circumstances. We have to know this. Joy flows out of a heart, not out of a circumstance. You got to realize that if God is going to put joy in your life, he's going to put it in your heart, and it's going to be based on the relationship that you have with him. And as a result of that, it will produce out of your heart the kind of life that you will experience. If you don't believe me, look at this verse in Scripture in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That's a very interesting statement right there. Guard your heart. Because out of it, out of it determines the course of your life. In one translation, it says out of it flows the issues of your life. So how many has got issues in your life? All right. How many have some really rough issues? Okay. Well, the issues that you and I deal with is simply a condition of our heart. 
deny it if you want to, but that's what the writer here, that's what the scriptures, that's what the book tells us, is that the issues that we face in life is directly related to, related to the condition of our heart. And so when we start putting all these pieces together, we have to realize that the heart is such an important place for us to be able to know authentic joy. And that's an interesting statement when the writer here says, guard your heart. Kind of sounds something like a cardiologist would say, right? Something that he would say to you. You know why? Because the same is true for your physical heart. For example, take a look at the physical heart. You and I both know that we have the heart, and it's got different, uh, it's got different connections to it that produces uh, the, the flow of blood into our extremities, into our bodies. And you have the capillaries, and you have the veins, and you have the arteries. And, and, and out of that aorta comes the, the, the arteries, and then the capillaries, and then these little veins. And, and did you know this, that the veins that's in your body, if you could tie all the veins and capillaries and the arteries together, did you know, and you could, you could just make one long line, did you know that you've got over 60,000 miles of veins in your body? You know how much that is? You can go around the world two times with that. That's how much you have in your life. So you ought to be able to at least make two laps around the world, right? <laughs> All right? That's, that's how intricate God has made the body. But yet you and I also know that a person can have a good heart but have bad arteries. And if you have a good heart but there's something that's clogging up the arteries in your life, then the tendency is then eventually it'll make the heart go bad, but it'll make the rest of the body become weak and make the rest of the body become ineffective for you and I. There is a prayer that King David prayed in Psalms 51. It is a psalm where David comes before the Lord and he's very transparent. If you look at David's life in this particular time, it's when David has come to the realization that he's messed things up, probably the worst he's ever done. I mean, he's fallen into sin. He, cre he committed murder. Um, he's, he's created a, uh, an Ill Ill illegitimate child. I mean, he has just let God down, and he did this with, while wearing a crown, while wearing the kingdom of Israel on his, on his robe. And yet, here he is at a place in his life where he's done so many good things for God to, to the point to where he's considered a man after God's own heart. And David is struggling in his own life. And he makes this prayer and he acknowledges this. He acknowledges that, listen, there are some things in my life that is blocking what I should be getting from this life that I should be getting from you, Lord. And I want to show these to you because I think in this prayer, and this prayer continues in Psalms 55, just so you know. But David, this prayer of reconciliation, I'm going to read these verses to you in Psalms 51. And then one verse in Psalm 55, or a couple verses in Psalm 55. I don't want you to see there's actually four specific things that David acknowledges that interfered with his joy in his life. Look at this in Psalms 51, verse 3. He says, For I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Now, this is a prayer. This is not some song that David is writing to praise unto the Lord. This is a very intimate. This is one of most David's intimate writings that he has ever recorded. He says, I know my transgressions. My sins are always before me. And then verse 7, he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. There it is, that statement again. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me, verse 10, this is a powerful verse, create in me a pure heart. You know why I say that? It's because out of the heart flows all the issues of life. And renew a steadfast spirit in me. A steadfast spirit in me. You know what David is saying? I'm tired of being inconsistent with my emotions. I'm tired of my life being up and down. I'm tired of my faith being up and down. I'm tired of my spirit man being up and down. I'm tired of being spiritual one day and struggling in flesh the another day. He says, I need you to fix this heart of mine because as a result of it, I'm all over the map. And my circumstances are moving me up and down, up and down, up and down. And he says, I need a steadfast spirit. And then he says, verse 11, do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. And then in verse 12, but restore to me, here's what he's asking, the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit. Why? So I can be sustained to sustain me. I think that David just pointed out four clogged arteries. 
He's got a good heart now. But there's some things that's blocking the flow. And he says, I still don't have the joy of the Lord. So what, what is it that David acknowledges? Well, the first thing I believe that's blocking this joy from flowing is, number one, is unrepentance. Some things that he hasn't really taken care of with the Lord. Because he said in verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sins are always before me. So here David is making the acknowledgement. Listen, I know part of the problem is I got some transgressions that I haven't settled with you. You know, in our culture today, which wasn't the struggle back then because grace, there wasn't the dispensation of grace. But today, because we live in a time where there's been such a dispensation of grace, somehow we have equated that grace is a substitution for repentance. And whenever we assume righteousness through grace without repentance, we will always repeat our transgressions. I want to say that again. If we assume grace without repentance, we will will repeat the very same transgressions that got us in that place again. So David is basically saying, and we we don't fully understand all that David is going through in this condition. But what we do know is that David attempted to hide his sin. He tried not to bring it up. He didn't want it brought up. He just wanted to keep it down and keep it on the down low. And he really thought he could keep it from the Lord, but that's not going to happen. And by doing so, David allowed deception to enter into his heart. And let me tell you the deception that I think is the most dangerous deception that can get into a Christian's heart. Because I think it's what happened to David. I think David concluded because he had done so many good things for God that his goodness would stand for his repentance. That, you know, he, he, he must have in his deception say, well, I can't be that bad because I've done a lot of good things for the king, for, for, for the Lord as a king. And I've done a lot of great things. And, I, you know, I, I'm a worship leader. And, and I, by this time, he's already killed the, the greatest enemy that Israel had faced, which was the Philistines. He'd already taken that giant down by this time in his life. He'd done so many great things. And David must have made that human error that so many Christians make is the fact that they feel like, well, you know what? I don't really have to go into deep repentance because I think my good counts for something. And unfortunately, what happened, a prophet by the name of Nathan had to come and call him out. And he had to hear the charges from heaven because of his sin that he had committed. David finally reached the point where he said, okay, search my heart. Because these charges are against me. And I'm still not feeling right. I'm still not experiencing the life that I've had before. Is there anything in your life anything in your life that you have not asked the Lord specifically to forgive you of? It's blocking. If it's still there, it's blocking something in your life. Get it out. Here's the second blocked artery. I'm certainly not a cardiologist, so I'm trying to do the best I can to talk like one. Thank you. I, I, from you, I received that. We find it in the same verse in Psalms 50, 51, verse 3. He said, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Notice the blocked artery of condemnation. He says, My sins are always before me. Do you know what a, a, a condemning heart, you know how a condemning heart will leave you feeling? It'll make you feel heavy. It'll make you feel in despair. It will make you feel shame, guilt, regret, even pity for yourself. When you have condemnation coming over your life and you're just feeling that you're never really right with God, even though you've surrendered your heart to God because you are allowing that condemnation to stay over you. As I said last Sunday, let me tell you something. When it comes to condemnation, it is not Satan that puts condemnation on you. It's when you believe the way you see yourself and you condemn yourself. That is the worst kind of condemnation. Satan's always going to condemn you. He's always going to accuse you of things. 
But it's when you condemn yourself, that's when you have made that condemnation to become something that's blocking your life because you can't forgive yourself. You can't let it go. Now, I know there's some people out in this room that you're thinking, man, I don't have those kind of regrets. I've, yeah, I've, I've done stuff, but you know, I've, I'm, it's under the blood, and I'm okay with it. I can even talk about it, and I don't, I don't feel shame of it anymore. God took care of the shame. Well, not everybody feels that way. Because not everybody has lived the life that you've lived. And some people have crossed the line so far in what they know that they should not have done to where the scar or the memory is a constant struggle in their life. And because of that, they're trying to walk in faith. But then at certain times in their life, at certain moments in their life, in certain places in their life, it's like Satan has jurisdiction over their thinking when they get in certain places of their destiny. And the enemy just says, you're not good enough to be where you see yourself. You're not good enough to believe where God sees you. You have done way too many things. David said, I know my transgressions and my sin is always right there in my face. But the word of God reminds us that there is power to break this off. And, and I love the way it's written in 1 John 3, verse 20 through 22. It says, for whenever the heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Somebody ought to say amen. And he knows everything. Now, I think how you read that, I think the way that you put the inflection on your voice can change the way you perceive that. So I'm going to read it with a couple of different voice inflections on that. And he knows everything. Here's the first one. When our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And he knows everything. Okay. You kind of feel that. You kind of feel a little spooked, like, oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, he knows everything. All right? So some of you, that's how you're hearing it. That's exactly the way you're hearing that verse. Your heart's condemning us, and God's greater than your heart, and he knows everything. Okay? Now, here's the way I think you need to hear it, okay? For, wherever, for whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. He already knows it. He already knows what you've done. Now, that feels a little bit different, don't it? You know? It's like the parent who the child is caught in the act of disobedience. And the expression of the parent is, oh, I know what you did. Or, I know what you did. You, you, get, the, you get the feeling? Okay. One of them wants to go hide. Or put pad right here because you know it's coming. Are the other ones like, I'm getting ready to get embraced. And I'm getting ready to get lifted up in the mercy of God. He knows everything. That's, I think, the way you ought to hear it. And then he says, beloved, if our hearts condemn us, or not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because, he, but because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. You can't have joy in your life and condemnation over your mind and heart. They, they just, they won't mix. They won't. I'm going to give you three words to set you free. You ready? Get over it. Maybe those three words didn't work. Let me try three more words. Let it go. Get over it. Let it go. Okay. Not enough? Three more words. Just move on. Just move on. Leave it in the past. God's greater than your heart. He knows everything. So when the devil starts condemning you, 
And the devil says, oh, God knows everything. You can look at the devil and say, God knows everything. Some of y'all get that later, okay? All right. It'll, it'll hit you a little bit later. Some of y'all are like, I'm confused. I'm not understanding what he's trying to tell me, okay? All right. Here's the third clogged artery, I believe, in David's life that we find here. It's pride. Oh, you had to go there, didn't you, Pastor? You just had to touch on that one artery or nerve of mine. Pride. Look at verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Look at verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That statement, the bones you have crushed, that's not the first time that David uses that statement in Scripture. In fact, he used it a lot. Not only did he use it, but actually Solomon also used it in the verse that I read in our text in Proverbs 17, verse 22, where he talked about, a merry heart that's good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Okay. So there's something in this I think we need to pay attention to. What is, the, what, is the, uh, what is being implied here when David makes this statement that let the bones you have crushed rejoice? Why does he on many occasions talk about his bones being broken, his bones being crushed? I mean, we know that's not a physical uh, structure that he's referring to. But what David is, first of all, hoping that we get in this is that the danger of trying to live your life with the spirit of pride on you is that you forfeit the strength of God. When a person is living and driven by a spirit of pride, then you forfeit the strength of God. Therefore, you are your source of strength. And David gets this picture. He doesn't say, you know, my arm is crushed, my, 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 my feet are broken. But I want you to get this picture that David is carrying the whole world on his shoulders. He's the one trying to hold up everything. He's the one that's trying to keep everything in his life together and trying to keep it all lifted up and trying to keep it in order and trying to keep it above the storms, trying to keep it above COVID, trying to keep it above all the struggles in life, trying to keep it above all cultural uh, attacks. He's trying to take care of everything himself. And basically, I want you to get this picture. It's getting too heavy. It's getting too heavy because it's bigger than him. So therefore, he's basically saying, every bone in my body is being crushed because I'm trying to hold up the world all by myself. I'm trying to hold up my world. And for some of you, depends on who the people are in your life, unfortunately, you've been recruited to hold other people's worlds up. So now you've got the increase of everybody else's world. That you're, am I preaching to anybody other than myself this morning? Come on, somebody. So you're trying to keep all this held up, lifted up. And, and, and what you don't realize is what is motivating you to think that you're the one that's supposed to hold it up? Well, I'm just trying to be responsible. Uh, wrong. That's pride. That's pride. That's David saying, I try to do all of this, and here's what I end up. And so that's why he says in verse 12, Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Give me a spirit that says, Lord, here, you take it over. You carry it. I can't do it. David, I mean, he, he really did. I mean, you, you go and look at David's life. He was pretty good at representing the Lord, making it look like that he was God's man. While in many times he was doing so much of it in his own strength. How many times do we do that? Especially as preachers. We're the most guilty on that one. Third point is the one that really hit me hard. Just so you know. A little confession here, okay? I found a fourth blockage in David's heart. He needed a quad. He needed a quad bypass is what he needed. David continues this prayer of repentance in Psalms 55. 
And I, let me read it to you, and then if I can flip the slides here, and then I'll tell you what it is. It's probably going to stand out anyways when I read it. But look at these verses in verse 4 of Psalm 55. He says, My heart is in pain within me. The fears of death have come upon me. Let me stop there. The fears of death. You know how many Christians went just from fearing a bad day, fearing a struggle, to now they're trapped in this sense that I fear that I'm going to die here. Something's going to take me out sooner than what I'm supposed to. There are so many Christians right now that fear that they've got something in them and they're getting ready to die. He says, the fears of the death have come on me. He's, verse 5, I have begun shaken with fear. Fear has power over me. And I say, if only I had the wings of a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would go far away. I would live in the desert. I would hurry to my safe place, away from the wild wind and storm. Found one more clog here. And this one was really blocking the flow of joy in his life, and that was the spirit of fear. Again, in David's transparency, we see him overwhelmed with the weight of worry in his life. And he did exactly, or he said exactly what most of us do when we deal with that. He said, I just want to run and hide. I can't handle this. I don't like this. Where'd this come from? Why is this happening to me? What happened that makes me feel that God is mad at me or that God is good, but he's going to take me out sooner than later? And David is, he says, you know, I've become a fearful man. I find myself wanting to run. I want to hide from my enemies. I want to get away from my responsibilities. I just want to get away from this all. And David says, this thing is taking over my life. He says, I've begun shaking with fear. Fear is, I mean, he, this is a strong statement. He says, fear is power over me. Fear has, I can't control it. It has Power over me. And then he's got this rationale. Oh, if I could just get away, if I could just take the wings of a dove and I could just fly out. Just get away from it all. Now here's the problem with that statement. For any of you that's ever dealt with fear, and you put wings on and you flew away. Or you put your running shoes on and you ran from your place of life. Here's the problem. When you get to where you're going, it's still there. Can't get away from it. It's silly for David to say, you know, here's what I got to do. I just got to get away. I just got to run. I got to quit. I got to get out of my job. I got to get out of life. I got to get out of the people, I got to get out of this place. I got, I, get, I just need to get my, I just need to go, I need to go somewhere. I got to do something. I got to get, I need to go on vacation. That's it. That's the answer. I need to go. Just get away from it all. And for a moment, it seems like you're kind of like, oh, I'm away from it all. But then all of a sudden, it finds its way back into your heart. And there you are. Spoils. You're a little Disneyland on it. You know, Jesus obviously knew that in the end times, this was going to be one of the greatest battles that we face because one of the most consistent messages that Jesus preached before he finished his mission on the earth was this consistent message of about having peace in your heart. And he said in verse 
27 of John 14, some of the last recorded words that Jesus spoke, a, a part, of, part of that, those last messages that he said. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Don't, don't let this get on you. Don't let this get on you. Don't let this get inside of you. There's a different way. There's a, there's a way that you and I can, can know God and God can begin to console our hearts and begin to console our emotions and get us away from this overwhelming sense that, that, that it's going to get bad and it's going to get horrible and we're going to get caught up in it and we're going to become victims of this. David said in Psalms 94 verse 19, he said, when anxiety, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. When the Lord consoles the heart of a person, when the Lord's word, when the Lord's presence comes over your life, then it just kind of calms all those fears. You know, he was so good at that. Jesus would walk into so many dreadful, fearful storms, darknesses, difficulties, and he would find people troubled and trembled. And the moment he walks in and says, I'm here, and people knew who he was, that was the key. Fear would have to go. Did you know that not every time the Lord walked into a storm did he calm the storm? But he always calmed the person in the storm. Why does your joy matter? Why is it you and I having this authentic joy matter? This, very, this is not part two of a sermon. This is just... Kind of wrapping it up, but there's quickly three things I want to show you why your joy matters. Well, this is very important, especially for today. First of all, it's because it renews your strength for life's challenges. When you have the joy of the Lord flowing through your heart and going through these arteries that have been cleansed and, and opened up and flowing in your life, then what it does, it begins to give your entire body strength. And it begins to give you strength for the challenges that you and I are going to face. Listen to what David said, Psalms 18, verse 28, 29. Your light is a lamp for me. The Lord, my God, lights up my darkness. In your strength, David says, I can crush any army. With my God, I can scale any wall. You know what David is saying? I got this. You know what David is basically saying? When I know I have the joy of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, I got this. I can handle it. I can make it through this. I can get through this is what he's saying. Without it, we'll question whether or not strength is going to get us through. And yet when, we're, when we don't have a choice and we have to walk through it, we end up trying to do it in our own strength. Here's the second reason. These are very practical reasons why your, why your joy matters. And number two is because it, revi it, resi it revives your passion for your purpose. When you have the joy of the Lord as your strength. And you know what it does? It revives your passion. And you know why passion is so important? Passion oftentimes is the difference. What makes that's, that's the difference that brings a person to the victory and those who quit halfway. Dana and I, when we were home last evening, we were watching. We haven't really watched much of the Olympics. Um, but we were watching the men's marathon. And I'm just always intrigued with that. It, it's always been a, <laughs> a dream of mine. To run a marathon, okay? All right. Yeah, right. I know. I felt, I felt it, okay? Don't, don't crush my dreams. When I get to heaven, I'll run many marathons, okay? Oh, That's right. I got this, okay? But, uh, but uh, you know, the, the times that I have, you know, a marath everything is relative, right? Okay? For these guys running a marathon... A marathon to them is 26.2 miles, okay? A marathon for me is two miles, okay? It's all relative, okay? And when I, when I was kind of years ago, and you guys heard me talk about this, when I was kind of getting into running, then, then the most I've ever ran was six miles at one time. I've done that a couple times. That's pretty good, right? I ran a marathon in one week one time, okay? It took a whole week, but I ran it in one week. I spread it out in a week, and I ran a marathon in one week. That was kind of my goal. And you know that um, when you're running, they, they talk about it's called the, the hitting the wall. 
you hit that point, you're thinking, oh my goodness, can I do this? Am I able to, to accomplish this? Can I, can I reach my goal? And, and it's, it's, a, it's a place of contemplation. And many people give up at that point because they, they're just like, you know, both voices are going, you can't do this. You're going to collapse. You're running out of strength. You got this. You can do this. Just press on. So you're at that point where all of a sudden both voices become ample. How many runners I got in here? Okay, I, I saw you smiling just now, Nicole, and it made me wonder if you knew what I'm talking about. You're, you're getting into my head here in my sermon. You can see where I'm going. So all of a sudden you get to that point where both voices are talking loud. You got two cheering sections. One over here saying, you're not going to make it. You're going to fail. You might as well just back up. You're not ready for it yet. Just walk the rest of the way in. Okay. But then there's another voice that says, no, press on. You can do this. You got this. You can, you can, you can face it. You can go. And so really... You will end up doing whichever voice you listen to, whichever voice you shut down. So, and I've learned that. And, and, and it's not easy because both voices are just going at one time. All right? I was literally watching last night, and I, I, don't think, I don't know if it was live. It said live underneath the, 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 the network logo, but I think it might have been pre-recorded. But we were watching it last night, and I was watching. I wasn't watching the guy that was winning. He was way out there. He won like a minute and 21 seconds or something like that. I was watching the four guys that was in second place battling for the bronze and the silver. And there was four of them. And I, there was one of the guys, he had blue shorts on, and I kept telling Dana, I said, that guy is going to get the silver. You watch. And he was kind of standing in the mix of that little pack, and they were about a minute and 20 seconds behind the gold, so, but it was like their own little race going on. And I could just see in him, that there was, I mean, you could see they were exhausted. It was hot. They were pouring water on themselves as they were running. And I mean, it was a very difficult marathon for those guys to run in Tokyo this last, this last week. And, and, but I told Dana, I said, that guy's going to, that guy's going to get the silver. I'm telling you. And they get to that last stretch and all of a sudden, man, I mean, he is, he is going at it. He is going at it. And then if any of you watched it, there was another gentleman from another country that, I mean, this guy's using up all of his energy, and he's telling one of his friends, come on, we got this. We got this. And he was motioning for the guy that was in the back of that pack of four to come up with him. And somehow those two guys got the silver and got the bronze. And, 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 and I told him, I said, I knew that guy was going to do it. I just knew he was going to come out of that pack, and he was going to he's gonna take the silver. I could see it because I could see the passion in him. He went beyond he went beyond his obstacles. He went beyond what was against him because there was a passion on his. He wanted it. He wanted it. And joy revives your passion for your purpose. It lets you know, I'm here for a reason, and I'm going to get this done, and I'm going to do this. That's the difference. Psalms 37, verse 4, be happy in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalms 16, verse 11, you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures evermore. Wow. It revives your passion for your purpose. The third thing is it reveals the hope of Christ to others. When you have joy in your life, authentic joy, in a world where there's not so much of that going around, it brings hope to other people that there's hope in Christ. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 8 and 2, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflown in the wealth of generosity on their part. In other words, he's saying because you had joy, it even in your time of affliction, it reached other people. It helped other people along the way. I said, I'll close with this. We'll, we'll close. You can stand with me. If you don't mind, let's stand together. I said, I think it was two weeks ago. We were talking about what do you do when the Lord says, now I'm going to keep you in this for a little bit longer. What do you do when the Lord says, you're going to have to stay in this turmoil longer than you thought? Like I preached last Sunday out of when Jeremiah 29, 11 gave that verse of, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you, to give you hope in the future. How that 
in Jeremiah 28, verse 15, the Lord had to rebuke Hananiah, who told the people that they were only going to be in bondage for two years. And he lied. That prophet lied. And God said, no, these people are not going to be in bondage for two years. You'll tell them what I'm going to do. They're going to be in bondage for 70 years. But also tell them that in this time of difficulty and turmoil, I'm still going to make you prosper. I'm still going to be good to you. Even in a difficult place, in a difficult time, in a difficult season, you are able to know the goodness of God. And I want to read a verse to you, Habakkuk chapter 3, these three verses. Even if the fig tree does not grow its fruit, or its figs, and there is no fruit on the vine, even if the olives do not grow and the fields give no food, even if there's no sheep within the fence and no cattle in the cattle building, Yet I will have joy in the Lord. I will be glad in the God who saves me. Because the Lord is my strength. And he has made my feet like the feet of a deer. And he makes me walk on high places. Now I know what you read. I know what you're thinking. Boy, how does Habakkuk say all of this? He must have had some really good faith, amazing faith to trust God. So what is Habakkuk building his confidence on when right now what's going on is not good? He's put his confidence in God and everything's going bad and the turmoil's still going on. And yet he's still saying, I got joy in the Lord. You know why? Because you got to know what he said in previous verses. Because in the previous verses, the Lord told Habakkuk, you're going to go through a difficult time. But I'm going to make all of this turn for your good. And my joy will be your strength in all of this. He had the word from the Lord. He was confident that God was in charge. Let me tell you something about COVID, about culture, about morality, about the media, about politics, about this world. And this ought to be the thing that we hinge everything we believe on, and that's this. In spite of what it looks like, God is still in charge. He's still in charge. So we can still possess the joy of the Lord. I'm going to do something different this morning. I feel really strong that I need to pray for some people this morning. I know how normally when we dismiss the service, we just pray in our seats. But I feel so strong this morning that there are people that you need to step out of your place of struggle and discouragement. I want to go ahead and go offline if we can, because this is a very personal moment here, if we can. Thank you, those that viewed this service. We're going to close the service right here, but I want to take a few moments to pray for those that are in this building. It doesn't mean that you don't matter, but this is...